Hello. There's a story in Buddhism about Avalokiteshvara, who is the Bodhisattva of compassion. And Avalokiteshvara made a vow. He declared that he was going to work ceaselessly for the benefit of all beings out of compassion for them. And that if he should ever break this vow, that his body would split into a thousand pieces. So after taking that vow, he spent a huge amount of time, I don't know how long, maybe lifetimes even, working for the benefit of sentient beings out of compassion for them, responding to the suffering that was in the world. And then he stopped for a little while just to take stock of the situation. And he looked out over the world and he realised that actually he hadn't even been able to benefit not even a small percentage of the vast numbers of beings who were suffering. And at that point, something happened in his heart, as though his heart was broken. And he said, it's too much. This task is too big an undertaking. I can't possibly continue to work for the benefit of all beings. And as soon as he said this, as soon as he thought this, of course, his body shattered into a thousand pieces. But then what happened was that his, um, by the intervention of the Buddha Amitabha, his body became reformed into a body with a thousand arms and a thousand hands and into eleven heads. So this new being emerged out of this broken heart. A new heart was formed. A new compassionate being was created, came into being. And the thousand arms and the thousand hands are, of course, a symbol of uh, what's necessary to respond to the sufferings of the world of all beings. So one pair of hands is just not enough. Actually not even a thousand arms and hands would be enough, but it's a symbolic number. It just tells us that an awful lot is required to respond to the suffering in the world. Maybe we can't take it all on for ourselves. We can do it in conjunction with other like-minded people, perhaps. We can think of ourselves as just one pair of hands out of the thousand. And also Avaloki, Avalokiteshvara's head shattered and formed into 11 new heads. So these were looking out in all of the directions, able to see more clearly all the uh, sufferings of the world and to be able more effectively to respond. So that's the story of Avalokiteshvara becoming a thousand-armed Avalokiteshvara. We also perhaps have this experience that Avalokiteshvara had where any kind of suffering just seems too much for us to deal with. Uh, sometimes life hits us very, very hard. Maybe something happens to us personally. We have a particular experience of grief, an experience of bad news, either about ourself, our health, or the health of a dear friend or a loved one. And it seems unbearable. We have this really bad um, news which comes upon us. Life hits us hard, right in the guts. It could be something very personal like that, or it could also be something which we hear about, uh, some item of world news. 
something to do with uh, racism perhaps, which is very big in the news at the moment. Um, some years back, uh, refugees were very big in the news because there seemed to be an awful lot of refugees moving about different parts of the world trying to escape terrible situations and many of them dying in the attempt to escape. So these stories can be really heartbreaking stories and of course there was the time of 9-11 when the Twin Towers came down and unspeakable suffering happened at that time and I remember hearing about that and feeling this experience you know right in the heart in the guts you know how as a simple human being an ordinary human being how can I possibly deal with uh, such experiences without cracking up but more recently over the last few years perhaps I've been having a sense that we need to go there. We need to go to that place where it feels as though our heart is perhaps going to break. We need to even allow our heart to break. And of course, we don't literally mean the organ, which we call the heart, the organ which pumps blood around our bodies. We don't literally mean that that heart will break. What we're talking about is the emotional heart or the heart mind, the heart mind which contains possibilities of metta or loving kindness and possibilities of karuna, compassion, and mudita, joy, and equanimity. All of these things are also part of the heart, the heart mind's experience. When in Buddhism we do bodhicitta practice, we make a connection with the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, we make a connection with the transcendental, that which inspires us, that which opens us up, opens us up to love, compassion and joy and equanimity. But we also open ourselves up to suffering in that meditation practice. We open ourselves up to the suffering of all beings in the world. We allow that suffering to come into us and we allow that suffering then to be transformed through our connection with the Buddhas, the enlightened ones, the awakened ones. So we don't have to, it's not as though we personally have to deal with all that suffering. It's more that we call on our connection or establish our connection with the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and then they do the transformation for us or, or, or we are an agent for that transformation to take place through us. And also we're able to take on that suffering of the world because we ourselves know what it is to suffer. We know personally what it is to experience that grief that um, depth of pain which seems too much, too much for words, um, that place where we really want to cry our eyes out and perhaps we do that or perhaps our grief just dries up, shrivels up and we can't even cry or we can't even express it through our voice. That's how it is sometimes for me. I experience the pain of grief and suffering, but I don't seem able to express it either by crying out with my voice or crying with my eyes. Some people can do that. Many people cry with their suffering and it must be a great relief. I sometimes manage to do that, but sometimes I can't do it. But it doesn't matter, regardless of whether I can express it in that way or not, um, I've learnt through experience over years that it's best to just experience whatever the suffering is for us. Experiencing it without shrinking away, 
without looking to escape into something else. And what I find is that the outcome of not shrinking away is that eventually that grief will turn into something else. It will turn into joy or compassion or love or equanimity. Those, in a way, I think, are the inevitable outcomes if we maintain awareness and stay in that place for as long as it needs. Even though it's painful, sometimes even unbearable, as though our hearts are breaking. But because things change, because things are impermanent, the outcome of that pain and suffering at some point is going to be the the turnaround, the change, and the change into uh, a more positive, a more bearable experience. But it only comes if we maintain awareness. It doesn't come if we try to run away from the pain or hide away from it. There's a poem which a friend has sent to me very recently called The Unbroken by Rashani Rea. She says, there is a brokenness out of which comes the unbroken, a shatteredness out of which blooms the unshatterable. So if we don't go to that place of brokenness, if we don't go to that place of shatteredness, then we won't experience the unbroken or the unshatterable. We won't experience whatever can rise from the ashes of our grief. So, to give it another um, name, another label, we can say that the, uh, the broken-heartedness we experience is like a spiritual death and the, mending, the eventual mending of the heart is like a spiritual rebirth.